Job chapter 25, we finished chapter 24 last week in a flurry. And uh, chapter 25, I, I promise you, <laughs> I shouldn't say I promise, we should finish it today. <laughs> it's a pretty short chapter. Stranger things have happened. But we'll get right into it. Job chapter 25. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies, and upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that uh, you, uh, Lord, uh, be with this uh, Sunday school hour, Lord, and clear our thoughts and, uh, Lord, hearts of any, uh, Father, anything that uh, might be hindering. And uh, God will give you all the praise. Pray again, Lord, that uh, you do keep folks safe uh, coming here if they're still traveling. And uh, thank you for what you're going to do this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, uh, here in Job chapter 25, uh, this is the final uh, argument from Job's detractors. Um, it is, you know, after all this time, after all the back and forth, this is, this is it. <laughs> this is the last straw. And uh, it's a short speech uh, compared to the, to the rest of the, uh, uh, of the tirades that have been going on. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a speech that seemingly uh, is an attempt to either, either two things. You can, when you read this chapter, you can, get two, you can go two ways, I believe. Uh, I, I, I believe it's one, uh, but uh, you, could, you could argue uh, that uh, the mentality of Bildad here in this passage of Scripture, um, either it's a t- an attempt to put a final nail in Job's coffin to, um, to say, okay, Job, we're, we're, we're through arguing uh, and, and this is it, or... You could take it as a, a final admission that that these three gentle, friends of Job, um, after all that they've said and all that they've accused Job of, they find that here's one of them anyway, that's finally admitting that they themselves are not even uh, perfect in a perfect state with God. Most likely, it's the first. I don't think. Uh, because of what we read later on in the book of Job and, and what God has to say to these three gentlemen, uh, I don't believe it's the latter. I don't believe they're, uh, they're, they've gotten humbled to this point. Um, nonetheless, the things, that, uh, uh, Bildad, the things that Bildad says in this chapter, the comments that he makes are right on the money. And again, we've seen that throughout the study. Um, they're, even though they're wrong, they're, they're dead wrong in their estimation of Job and their, um, in their judgment of him, they are, the things that they've said are, are right. They, uh, many times they've said no doubt things in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because again, we, when we look at Job, when we look at what's going on in Job's life, we see that God is do, doing all kinds of works. When the Bible says God worketh all things, he, he and, and, and you've heard the statement, you know, uh, it's about some folks that they, they know how to work the angles. <laughs> God knows how to work the angles. And, and it may, and, and, and everything that's gone on, God is trying to do number, a number of things. N- number one, I believe he's, he's going to convince the devil uh, that uh, there are people that love God for who God is, regardless of what happens to them. That's what that's what Satan's um, argument was in the beginning, if you recall. He's going to prove to the devil that uh, uh, that even though man is a lower being than than he, uh, he created him with a free will. Even in in, in that sense, uh, he can still love God and and, and trust God. Although things don't always, you know, work out this like you like, and things don't all, and you don't always say the right things throughout the uh, the trials, 
but nonetheless, Job has not uh, fallen for the devil's accusation that he's going to curse God. He's not done that. And then number two, we know that God is going to teach these three guys, that uh, these three friends of Job, a lesson. And, and that's going to be evident as we f- go further in the study. And then last of all, and maybe most importantly, he's teaching Job who he is. And he's, even though Job hasn't done anything wrong, even though Job hasn't, uh, in, in the sense of re- warranting a, a, a direct hit, I guess you can call it, um, he has uh, some, some issues with self-righteousness. He has some issues with, um, with his, within his own life that God is going to work out. And, uh, and then ultimately, the whole reason it's penned down in Scripture is for our benefit. The whole reason God uh, allowed this, this, this event in this man's life to, to be put into Scripture is for our benefit. The things that were written aforetime are written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Uh, when, when we go through life... And, uh, and, 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 you know, we allow little things to, to get us off course. We allow, you know, our little feelings to get hurt. We allow things in the church to, you know, people want to quit church over some, some very minor issues. Uh, they, get, they get miffed at some uh, things in the, in, that go on in the church or in, 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 in families or what, what have you. Uh, if we could just turn, stop a minute... And look at and step back and say, is this really worth it? I mean, there's people I mean, just recently in our own congregation that have gotten some very horrific news in their life. They, they, uh, and many, many of you have been there in the past and, and God has, has been gracious to, to, to clean you up of, of the cancer. But that doesn't always happen like that. And we get mad or we get miffed at some of the littlest things. And uh, God says, listen, uh, consider Job. Consider what Job went through, and maybe you'll take a little bit better look uh, outlook on life. Maybe you won't uh, get so, uh, uh, so aggravated and so flustered when, you know, when uh, your, your uh, uh, preacher doesn't shake your hand or doesn't give you a call or doesn't, uh, you know, when, when things go wrong. Maybe you won't... Uh, Maybe you'll just realize that God is the one who knows all about you, even when the pastor may not, even when the other congregation church members may not. But God knows all about you, where you're going through, where you're at, and he's right there with you. He has entrusted you with the situation, whether it's, be, whether it's for a test to, to show you who you are, or whether it's for uh, the benefit of someone else. He's entrusted you with the situation. Don't blow it. And that's where we're at. And Bildad here is, in his, in his comments, in chapter 25, uh, as we said, they're right on the money. God is on the throne, and he is in charge, no matter what the situation is, politically, socially, religiously in the world. I mean, it looks pretty grim sometimes. We look, turn the news on, and, and, and things are just, they're, they're not good. Uh, as much as we love us, our country, as much as we love uh, what God has done with this, with, with this country, and when you look at across the, 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 the globe, and you look across the, uh, the states, and sin and, and wickedness is on the rise uh, the, 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 the wicked, the, the liberals, the, the, the people that are against our creator seemingly are getting the upper hand. And, and, it's, and if you just look at it from a worldly standpoint, even a Christian's worldly standpoint, it looks bleak. But God, through all that, no matter no, knowing, knowing who we have running the show in, in, in our country, knowing all the people that are making decisions, uh, that, uh, and all the people that are running the media, by, who, by, by which all, seemingly all, most of society gets their, their uh, philosophies from, no matter, no matter what's going on, politically, religiously, or socially, God is still in control. He's still on the throne, 
Uh, what he said is go- that's going to come to pass in this book is still going to come to pass in, in maybe in our lifetime. Maybe in our lifetime. We may, we may be on the cusp of getting out of here. Then again, we may not be. If we're not, then, then we need to uh, you know, hunker down, uh, get, get our, uh, our bearings on where we're at with God, what, what our job is supposed to be down here while we're living in this God-forsaken place, and go about our business and doing what God wants us to do. Bildad says in verse 2, Dominion and fear are with him. Dominion and fear are with him. Uh, John Gill, the commentator, wrote this concerning this passage. This dominion he is possessed of is universal. His kingdom rules over all, over all the angels, good and bad, over all men, over all the nations of the world, and the great men in it, the kings and princes of it, and over all of every age, sex, and condition. And it is absolute and uncontrollable. What? His dominion. He governs according to his will and is not to be controlled in his ways, nor is he accountable to any for what he does. And his kingdom is an everlasting one and his dominion forever and ever. That's why, that's why when, I, when I see people make comments or, or listen to people make comments uh, uh, like the president and, and, and they, you know, they, they think they're right in their philosophies and their policies. They think they're, they're, uh, they have uh, the, the right outlook on things. And they just take for granted that God is in agreement with them without going to Scripture, without knowing what God said about the matter, or if they do know, just totally rejecting it, most likely they're not even thinking of God to begin with. He's the furthest thing from their mind. And, uh, and they make policy, they make statements, they make uh, uh, decisions based on their philosophy uh, that has uh, been given to them by their father. And they have no, seemingly no uh, fear of God. No fear of God. But the Bible says here that dominion and fear are with him. Not only is he, is he in control of everything, uh, this, it's not saying that, uh, that God fears anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's referring to God's fear, not the God's fear, but the fear of the Lord. Uh, First Chronicles 22, uh, 29, 11 says this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. They can make claims on it. A uh, man can say that you know, we, we, own, we own this earth and we need to do this and that uh, to protect it. Uh, <clears throat> do what you will, but it's still God's. He owns it. He's going to do with it what he will. Um, it goes on to say, Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might. And in thy hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. When I think of um, our leaders, I, I, my mind goes back to Nebuchadnezzar. I, I, it never fails uh, that uh, when, when certain individuals are uh, on, on the television talking, he's who I think of for some reason. And... Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when he was put in his right mind, after going through a sobering uh, uh, rock bottom experience, turn to Daniel chapter four. He had he 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 ended up with the right estimation. So I guess it could kind of give us some hope that there is hope, even in uh, our leaders of today. 
because Nebuchadnezzar uh, went through a little fit of uh, uh, thinking that he had control of everything and, and God had to show him otherwise. In Daniel chapter 4, in Daniel chapter 4, the Bible says, uh, uh, let's, well, let's start reading in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my uh, bed and the visions of my head troubled me. And so he sent for all the, the, the magicians, and uh, if you remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar just, he, he, he would walk around his palace, he would walk around and, 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 and look and see, and say, look at, look at what I've built, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished. And it sounds familiar every time you hear a certain individual all right, I'll just say it. Our president on television say and look trying to trying to trying to come up with something that he's accomplished that's seemingly good. But then Nebuchadnezzar, God shows him this dream and uh uh and the Bible says here in verse 28 all this that he dreamed came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar and at the end of 12 months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, remember me? <laughs> uh, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen seven times uh, shalt thou uh, shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He had forgotten, or maybe had never thought of it, that God is the one who allowed him to be in the position he was in. God gave him the power. Even though he was a, a pagan king, God set him up for, for his reasons. And the Bible says here in verse 33, in the same hour was the thing fulfilled and uh, Nebuchadnezzar ended up, you know, looking like a wild man eating grass and his hair grew long. Looked like Duck Dynasty, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, side note, uh, I love I love their morals, but uh, it's still a shame for a man to have long hair. I, I don't know what to tell you about that. But anyhow, um, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praise and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say, stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? This is the same king that thought he had everything under control, that thought he had built everything, that it was all due to his power. God had to put him on his face and, and put him, cut his uh, legs out from under him, so to speak. And now he's got the right estimation about who God is. He says in verse 36, At the same time, my reason return unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness return unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. If, you, if we keep that in mind, we'll be okay. You just keep in mind, when you start thinking a little more highly of yourself than you ought to, when, you, when that thought comes in, uh, you know, they don't know who I am. <laughs> Remember, God does. God knows who you are. And uh, he can really humble you. He's really good at it, at it. And so Bildad, regardless of the, uh, the misconception he has of Job, whatever he's saying here is right on the money. Dominion and fear are with him. Speaking of God, it says, He maketh peace in his high places. You say, wait a minute. I look around. There's no peace on earth. Well, it didn't say on earth. There could be peace on earth. If, if all of creation, if all of, all of earth would do what Nebuchadnezzar did and give glory and honor to God, 
Then we could have peace on earth. But the problem is, too many individuals that are in power, and and too many of us that aren't in power, have too much pride. And we're not going to give glory to God. We're not going to lift Him up and and put ourselves down. No, we're we're all too interested in, in lifting self up and making self number one. Like Lucifer did in the high places. Lucifer, though Lucifer attempted to bring chaos and, and riot and, 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 and catastrophe to heaven, when he decided that he was going to lift his self up and make himself equal with God, God stopped him in his tracks and has kept peace in heaven. Up there, there's no war. I'm speaking in the third heaven. We know in that second heaven, one of these days, there's going to be war. Again, some folks are going to be cast out. Uh, but God knows how to keep the peace. And uh, when, he, when he comes down, when it's all said and done, when he uh, uh, gets the throne that's due him down here on planet Earth during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, he will keep the peace. And it's not going to be, you know, this, uh, you know, this mushy, everybody's accepted and, and you can do what you want and it's okay. No, it's going to be, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. He's going to be ruling with, 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 uh, with judgment and rules according to the book. And if you don't like it, tough. Tough. Uh, they're, 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 the, the sodomites are all up in arms about, uh, about you know, being over there in, in Russia and the Olympics and all these things about uh, inequality. Man, if they think Putin is bad, wait till they get a load of Jesus Christ. Uh, You will conform to the book. You will conform to the law during the millennium. Thank God we are saved. We're going to be changed. We're going to, we're going to, we're not going to have to deal with having to make the decision to whether to do right or wrong. Amen. We're going to be ruling and reigning with him, hopefully, if we've served him and suffered down here. Uh, but we're going to be, we're going to have that new body like his. Amen. We're not going to even think sin. We're not even going to uh, even have the, 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 uh, the ability to sin. Praise the Lord for that. But there's going to be a whole lot of folks walking around on planet earth that are not going to be under grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They're going to be under a physical, they can see them. They're going to be able to see them. So it's not faith. They're going to be having to abide by his rules. That's why he's ruling with a rod of iron. And so there will be a time when all of uh, creation is at peace, but it's going to be only when Jesus Christ is ruling. He maketh peace. Turn back to Job chapter 25. He maketh peace in his high places. There one day there will be peace on earth. Don't worry. Job chapter 25 again, verse 3, he says, Is there any number of his armies, and upon whom doth not his light arise? The innumerable battalions of God's armies could cause the child of God to rest at ease when it comes to the cares of this life. When we, think, when we really think about who our God is and what he has at his disposal, how, why do we worry? Why do we fret? Why do we think that uh, you know things aren't just gonna aren't gonna work out? Um, we get we get we get uh, carried away with the things of this life and the cares of this world, and the God of this world gets our number and gets us to 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 fear and and fret. Uh, listen, the only fear that we should have is a, is a, a fear of our Father. The fear of man, the fear of Satan, even though we, we, we stress that we don't, uh, we don't treat him like many of the charismatics do, that he's, you know, some little, uh, you know, little cartoon somewhere that they can boss around. We don't do that. But we don't fear him. Why? Because our Father's in control. If, if God sees fit to let him at us, then that's his decision. And uh, it may not be pretty, it may not be uh, comfortable, it may not be fun, but but God is in control. And that's what Job is realizing. 
He, he still doesn't know at this point in our study, he still doesn't know what's happened, but he's, he's, he's learning to trust God. And that's what we have to do. While we are no match for the devil and his angels and his devils, God, uh, though not out of necessity, has plenty of firepower in his corner. He doesn't need anything. He, doesn't, he, doesn't, he didn't create all the angels to protect him. <laughs> all right? He didn't create a, you know, a mass of uh, uh, the, the host of heaven to, to protect him. But he just must uh, enjoy the fact that they're there because uh, he's got multitudes of them. How do we know that? Well, look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, the Bible, this is a reference to the war that's going to, be, that's going to take place in, in, in heaven. When I say heaven, I mean not in God's heaven. I know sometimes we, we go to this passage to talk about that event that happened back in Genesis 1. Uh, the first there between the colons there. Um, but this is an event that's going to take place in the future. And it's not in the third heaven, it's in the second heaven, which is the, 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 the outer space. And the Bible says uh, here in uh, Revelation chapter 12, and, it talk, and it's talking about Israel and, and how they're um, being uh, persecuted. And, they're fleet, and they flee into the wilderness, um, verse 6. But it says in verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. That's a war that's yet to take place. That's a war that's going to that's going to take place after the church is is has gone. Uh, this this event that's taking place in Revelation chapter twelve is not the church. Verse eight says, and and the, these angels that God created, Michael and his angels, prevailed not. I'm sorry, the devil, <laughs> devil and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. You say, wait a minute. You know, this has got to be talking about when they were in heaven, in the third heaven, and then, no. There, remember, Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and the power of the air. All right? He's controlling this atmosphere because God has allowed him. And in his angels, if you recall, this Bible says they are reserved in chains of darkness, right? And so it's not, uh, it's, this is not the, the third heaven war that's taking place. This is Satan uh, in the tribulation period. And the Bible says in, um, in verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out, where? Into the earth. Okay, and his angels were cast out with him. Look at down at verse twelve. This is the context of this passage. This is how we know this is not the original war in heaven. It says, therefore, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And so this is an event, that, this is the, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to take place in the tribulation period, but the whole point is God could have, by himself, just as he did when Lucifer attempted to overthrow his, his, his rule in heaven in the beginning, God could have by himself just, you know, knock Satan with a you know, flick of his finger from the, the second heaven down to earth. But he chose to use his armies, Michael and his angels. All right, and he's got these, these the, the Job and Bildad says in verse 3 of our text, is there any number of his armies? You can't number them. There's uh, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10 says this. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. He's talking about uh, the little children. 
He said, for I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. And so God has, I mean, you know, just I made the joke this morning that, uh, you know, <laughs> our angel was a little wore out trying to protect us on this road coming up here. Uh, that's not uh, that's not far fetched. God has you know has allowed uh, has has created angels and there's uh, there's multitudes of them. We can't even number them. Matthew chapter twenty six verse fifty three says, "Thinkest thou that I cannot pray my to my Father, and He shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels?" Christ said, "Listen, I could just just say the word and, and then." Like that, they'd be all over you. Job 25, verse 3, not only talks about the number of his armies in heaven, but it says, Upon whom doth not his light arise? Concerning his light, Dr. Ruckman writes this, Well, it was a spiritual light to the Jews. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 9. Luke chapter 2, verse 9. We're talking about the light. Bildad says, Upon whom doth not his light arise? Luke chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. That's what, when? When these angels came out. They were, they were beings of light. He says it was a spiritual light to the Jews and Gentiles. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Isaiah says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Dr. Ruckman goes on and says, not only was it a spiritual light to the Jews and Gentiles at his first coming, but it will be a shining light to Israel at his second coming. All right, go over to Psalm 68. (laughs) Psalm 68. Look at verse 1. And then verse 8 says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Look down at verse 8. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. He goes on to say, exactly as it appeared, this light appeared to Paul in Acts chapter 9 and verse 3. We know what happened with Paul. He got knocked off his horse. Why? Because he saw a great light. His physical lights, the Bible says uh, here, uh, light every man that comes into the world, according to Psalm 19, 1 through 6. And his spiritual light also. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 9. Turn back to John chapter 1. Bildad says, Upon whom doth not his light arise? In John chapter 1, speaking of John the Baptist, the Bible says... uh, There was a man sent from God, verse 6, whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of what? The light. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Bildad, you say, well, uh, did Bildad know what he was talking about? Uh, most likely not. He's writing under, he's, he's speaking, uh, no doubt under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's penned down in scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Bildad knows he's using, talking about, uh, the, the lesser light, the lowercase L, but God, the cross references are, are just innumerable to God being light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says. Back in our text in verse Job chapter 25 and verse 4. Let's try to wrap this up real quick. The Bible says, How then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? This is the question of the ages, and it is asked, though maybe subconsciously. 
you know, everybody, I'm sure this is not verbally asked by everybody, but uh, subconsciously this, this question is asked by every person at some point in their life. Uh, their, their, their conscience is asking them, how, how are you going to justify yourself with God? That's the question. That's what we have to answer. Uh, we have made our decision. We're not trusting in ourselves to be justified with God. Uh, we're, it's only, uh, justification only comes through the finished work of Christ. And when we come to the end of our own righteousness, we'll realize that. If you're saved here this morning, you came to the end of your righteousness saying, I'm not trusting in my own uh, righteousness to save me. How can a man be justified with God? Through Jesus Christ. That's the answer. He says in verse 5, Behold, even the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Well, we were cut short this morning because of uh, my tardiness, so we will not finish this chapter, unfortunately, and uh, because there's there's a lot here, so we're we don't want to shortchange shortchange it here. So we'll come back next time at verse five. We'll